someone else. So um, that's what we believe in. And um, for the last three weeks, we've just been in a, in a, a series uh, from the book of Nehemiah. And this week we're going to chat, we're going to continue on in Nehemiah chapter 4. Uh, if you have a Bible, you're going to need it today. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh no, I left it alone. <laughs> Honestly, pastor, the dog ate it. <laughs> Come on, man. Listen, if you don't have a Bible, physical Bible, paper Bible, then download one on your phone. Amen. The U version app, there is no excuse not to have a Bible. You're going to need it today because we're going to be looking at some scripture. Is that all right? Is that all right in church? Can we look at scripture in church? Is that all right? Yes. Or, or shall I just like give you like a TED talk and, 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 and encourage you and just tickle your ears with some stuff? Or do you, do you, or do you, or do you, want, do you want the word of God? Yeah. The Bible says the word of God is living and active. And uh, listen, that it's good for it's good for discipline. Hello, oh. huh? encouragement. Uh, so, uh, hey, before I start though, I just want to say congratulations to Big Brother Frank at the back there. Two years clean today, brother. Yeah. Yeah. God bless you, my friend. And then he is. He is two years old. That's why he's bald. He's still waiting for the hair to grow in. But seriously, congratulations, man. Two years. Glory to God for that, brother. It's just the beginning of, of a great, great walk with the Lord. Amen. So congratulations to you. And uh, so Nehemiah chapter 4 uh, the, this morning. If you're taking notes, which I hope you are, but you're going to see it on the screen, the title of today's message is called The Fight of Your Life. The fight of your life. Um, quick review of last week. And uh, last week we read from chapter 3. And last week in chapter 3 we see that they started to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. If you've been with us from the beginning of the, of the, of the series, you'll know that a man named Nehemiah received the burden, received the call from God to go back to his city and rebuild it and grow and do something for the glory and for the honor of God. The burden within his heart stirred him enough. That he set his heart on God's plan and God's call for his life. That he was willing to separate everything else for the calling of God. Is there anybody still willing to separate for the calling of God? You see what happened was the walls of Jerusalem at this point before Nehemiah had started building had been broken for 160 years. In biblical terms that was four generations. So there was a generational problem, generational curse, there was generational breakdown, generational debris, generational things that had lay stagnant and generations had overlooked it and bypassed it and thought, you know what, it's not for me to build, it's not for me. But Nehemiah was someone that says, you know what, it may not be my fault it's broken, but I can help rebuild it. And so he was, he was interested in being part of a generational legacy. Building something that would secure his future and also his children's children's. He believed and then they believed in a city-wide vision. And they committed themselves to serving the vision that they were part of. They realized also that their qualification to be used by God did not lay in their, in, their, in their masters or their business program, but their qualification to be used by God lay in their availability and their obedience to the call of God. And I want to just say that again, your qualification for the Lord in ministry has really not so much to do with your, uh, uh, you know, with your qualifications, your masters. Listen, it doesn't matter if you've got more degrees than the Masons. <laughs> your availability to, it's, it's your availability and your obedience to the voice of the master that is your qualification to be used for God's plan we also see that, uh, uh, that Nehemiah encouraged them to build in front of their own patch remember that the Nehemiah the Bible says that the men they started to rebuild the walls in front of their own homes and so what we see from that was that Nehemiah encouraged everybody to start and build their own life. Build their own patch. Build their own territory. Be stewards of their own part. Take ownership for that which is in front of you. And then lastly we saw and we spoke about it. That it's time that you stop dipping your toe in the church. Stop dipping your toe in the Christianity when you feel like it. Stop dipping your toe in the church when you're in crisis. Amen. His name is Christ, not crisis. Christ is available three, six, five, seven days a week. He's not just a crisis God. 
He's not just someone you run into when you're struggling, but he's someone you run into because you love him and you're grateful for what he's done in your life. So we also saw that it was time that you stop dipping your toe and jump in and be all in to God's plan. So chapter 4, we see that the work has began. They began to build something that would bring hope and bring security for their families and for their future and ultimately bring glory unto their God. Chapter 4, if you have your Bible with us, we're going to read from chapter 4, verses, uh, verse 14. I'm going to read in the New Living Translation this verse. I'll give you a moment just to turn there. Let me just pray for a moment. Holy Spirit, use me today as a, as a minister, as a vessel. I ask for the anointing ministry today of your Holy Spirit, God. Lord, let there be no gap between your will and my words. Lord, let me submit right now, Lord, the flesh of my body to the spirit of the living God. Let every heart be open today. Let every ear be open. Let every mind be open. Lord, I bind every distraction right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Chapter 4, verse 14. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Somebody say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Somebody say, remember the, Lord, remember the Lord. Who is great and glorious. And, watch this, fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Somebody say the fight of your life. Fight your life. If we take it back to the beginning of chapter 4, we, we, you read... Please read with me in your Bibles again from Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. And as I'm saying that, turn there right now, and in your book or in your Bible, possibly, potentially, probably, what you've done is you've went from chapter 3 to chapter 4, you've potentially turned the page. And I feel the Lord, as I was preparing for it, the Lord was speaking into my spirit this morning and said, Mark, tell the church, it's time that they turn the page. It's time that you stop living in the past. It's time that you moved and you allowed God to take you to where he wants to take you to. Stop living in the past. Stop living off the past defeats. Stop living off the past victim mentality. Stop living off the past situations and turn the page. Somebody say it's time to turn the page. It's time to start a new chapter. It's time to put the past behind and open yourself up to the possibilities that God might just be able to do something miraculous and supernatural in your situation. Is there anybody in here that just has a little inch of faith that believes that we serve a God who is still able to heal, to deliver, to set free, to restore, to change, transform, flip the script? Is there anybody with me this morning that still believes in a God who is glorious and a God who is all-powerful? Come on, if you believe that this morning, say, Pastor, I believe. Come on, there's the faith in this room. Ah. It's time to turn the page. It's time to start today, verse 1 of a new chapter. Verse 1, verse 2. Sam Ballot was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and Samarian, Samarian army officers, watch this, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build a wall in a single day just by offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of the stones from a rubbish heap? And charred ones at that. You see, the moment you try and build something for God, as a Christian, it, you will experience opposition. A church that has a citywide plan for revival and restoration will encounter opposition. One a dictionary definition for the word of opposition says this: it calls it. Hostile action. A dictionary definition for the word hostile, if you want to break it down just a little bit further, says this. Relating to an enemy. Unfriendly feelings. Resistance or intimidation. 
The moment you stand and start to say, God, I'm in. Lord, I'm coming. Lord, I'm leaving the past. Lord, I surrender to you. The moment you do that, I don't want to put you off, but I want to share with you the reality of being a Christian. Is the moment you say yes to Jesus, there's a target on your back. There's opposition, minions. <laughs> Running around everywhere trying to trip you up. <laughs> My kids love the minions. <laughs> But the moment you turn to God and the moment you center your heart on him and, and make a, a, a decision to build something, to repair something, to restore something for his glory and for his honor, expect opposition. Watch this. Expect resistance. Right. Expect intimidation. San Balat was the governor of a region of Samaria. It was a godless area. And he obviously had issues with Nehemiah and rebuilding the walls. In fact, the Bible says that he the Bible says that he flew into rage and mocked them. Watch that this is what he said. He says to them, What does this poor, feeble bunch of people think they're doing? <laughs> Do they actually think that they can rebuild this? Do they actually think that they can make something of their lives? He started to question their plans. Uh, you know, the enemy, is a, is a, is, is, for all of these things, he is a specialist in planting seeds of doubt. What Sambala was doing here, you see, by asking question after question after question, he was making them begin to start questioning themselves. It goes right back to the book of Genesis chapter 3 when the Satan started to deceive Adam and Eve. What did he do? He asked a question. He said, did God really say that? The origin of doubt comes through someone who doubts your ability or begins to start doubting God's business. He started to question their plans. He started to question their work. And questions can cause doubt. And it can lead to us questioning ourselves. It can lead us to actually thinking, man, did I actually think that I could change? Do I really believe that I can be free? <laughs> I'm not too sure now. Maybe they're maybe they're right. Maybe I'll always be an addict. Maybe they're right. Maybe I'll always be lonely. Maybe they're right. Maybe I'll always be stupid. And so the enemy, somebody, he started to plant doubt into the people. Questioning their ability, questioning their minds, questioning their work. You see, remember back in chapter 2 and chapter 3, the previous chapters, the, the chapters before today, remember they were all up for it. Remember they were all up for it. They were like, yeah, let's rebuild. Yeah, the vision was cast. You can be something, you can do something, you can make something. The vision was cast. And they're like, yes, Nehemiah, I'm in this. Let's rebuild this. Let's build. Let's restore. Let's pick up tools. Let's build the lives. Let's build something for it. Remember, they were in it. They were excited. They made a... And then the enemy came and started to sow seeds of doubt in their life. Next minute, a man named Tobiah popped up. How I many know there's always usually more than one of them? <laughs> he popped up. He stuck his neck out. And he began to mock him. He began to say things like this. Man, even if you built that, even if a fox stood upon it, it will crumble. Remember Goliath? Remember how Goliath mocked the children of Israel and David in 1 Samuel 17? Who am I, Goliath said, the big giant before David, who am I that you come to me with a stick? Am I a dog? David's reply was this, listen, you came to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of the heavenly armies. Today the Lord will conquer you. And so mockery is nothing new. Opposition is nothing new. It goes right back to the beginning of time. 
And so, so we have to see that when we sense opposition and we sense resistance and we sense the spirit of mockery upon our life, take that as confirmation that you're building something for the Lord. That you're trying to do something for the Lord. When David came up against Goliath, he was trying to defeat Goliath so they could take the land so their family could live there and settle there and grow there. He had to destroy Goliath before they could move forward. Goliath came with mockery. David came with the Lord behind them. And the truth about mocking and taunting is this. Is there's always a wee pinch of truth in it. It's got quiet here. Mocking and taunting this, there's always a pinch of truth in the watch this because they were feeble. Without God. They were working through rubble. Which brings me to my first point today. Rebuilding can get messy. You see, because they were having to work through years of rubble. Rubble was broken down things that were once strong and fortified. Rubble represents lives that were once good. Lives that were once strong. Rubble represents marriages that were once on fire. Rubble represents businesses that were thriving. Rubble represents children that have gone astray. Rubble represents building and getting dirty and sifting through what to keep and what to let go. They had to sift through what was good and what was bad. They had to sift through what to keep that would honour God and what to throw away that would dishonour God. They had to sift through the rubble. And sifting through rubble can get tiresome. Watch this. Because I mentioned they were building the wall of Jerusalem, right? Right? I want to let you a little bit of historical thing about the wall. The wall of Jerusalem, when fully built, was 12 meters high. Let me break that down into feet because I know that's how I work. 39 feet high. That's a lot of rubble. That's a, that's, a, that's a lot of barney right there. That's a lot of rubble. That's a lot of brokenness. That's a lot of destruction. That's a lot of separation. And so rebuilding can get messy. And remember when Nehemiah called all these people together, oh, they weren't professional builders. They weren't skilled in building walls or hanging gates or fitting doors. I think of Eric. You know, Eric's skilled at hanging doors and building walls and all that stuff. I ain't got Eric's skills. But I'm probably the worst DIY person in here. (laughs) I'm the type of guy that gets something from Ikea discards the discards the, the, the instructions and then go halfway through and go oh my I didn't take a bar again and start again <laughs> and so they weren't skilled in the areas of the rebuilding and, and because they weren't skilled uh, the, the wall probably was patchy in areas it, it possibly was squint in a few areas it some ballot and that, they probably started looking at it and when Tobiah came to see it, when he said, hey, even a fox would walk on that, it's going to crumble. There probably was a, an element of truth in that because the people weren't builders, so it wasn't a straight walk. <laughs> the, the, their wall was a bit crooked. And they were sifting through the rubble of the past and sifting through the rubble of the past can become tiresome. But what we see from Nehemiah is Nehemiah's response was, and this is what we can learn from Nehemiah today, when the opposition came, when the mocking came, when all of these things came, the Bible says he prayed. I wonder what's the first thing you do? 
What's the first thing we do when opposition comes? What's the first thing we do when somebody calls us names? Do we call them names? Who are you talking about, Stu, then? <laughs> <laughs> or, do we, or, or do we take it? Or do we... Uh, hey, we're not perfect, Gavin. Rome is the bubble today, so I know that. But we're, we're, we're teaching. Amen, brother. So we're teaching to see that Nehemiah's response was a great example for us to learn. Right? He didn't debate. He didn't start getting in a conversation with them. He didn't start slinging names back at them. Hello. He didn't plaster it all over social media. He didn't even deal with them directly. He took it to God in prayer. He asked God to deal with them. He asked God to fix the situation. And in the flesh and in the old self, we want to fight fire with fire. Eye for an eye. You call me, I'll call you. You punch me, I'll punch you harder. But Nehemiah's response, and this is what I'm trying to show us, is as we teach the Bible and as we walk through the Bible and as we see Nehemiah's response. And why I want to share Nehemiah's response was, is because he actually made it. Like he actually finished what he started. And so if we can look at Nehemiah's response, maybe we just might finish what we started for a change. Instead of getting halfway through or quarter way through, then somebody says something and somebody doesn't like us and somebody throws a mocking taunt and somebody throws something in and somebody calls us names, then we throw the, we throw the tools down, throw our toe, spare our dummy out and go home. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm off my <laughs> Come on, you're laughing, but you know it's true, man. <laughs> For Nehemiah, prayer was the first resource, Amen. not a last resort. When times of opposition came, God wanted us and wants us to rely on him. It's the purest way of exercising and expressing a reliance on God. Lord, these people are harassing me. Lord, this situation is killing me. Lord, I'm trying my best, but people keep on calling me and people keep on listening. People keep on pushing my buttons, Lord. I'm, I'm ready just to explore. I'm ready to go old school. <laughs> but Lord, I give this to you. I surrender it to you. Because Lord, I realize that if I'm getting this opposition and mockery and taunts, I realize that I'm doing something good, that I'm going in the right direction, and Lord, I'm not about to stop to entertain these Muppets. <laughs> the, time, the time in prayer, watch this, your time in prayer is never wasted. It's where we cast our anxiety, it's where we cast our fear, it's where we cast our discouragement, and it's where the Lord gives us a second wind. To carry on building. When you're in prayer and you're casting your burdens and you're laying down your anxieties and you're sharing your heart and you're crying before the Lord and you're sharing your innermost being and you're casting down your everything, you're in there and you're in there and you're pouring, you're pouring, pouring. It's in that place of prayer that the Lord reminds you of your why. Which brings me to my second point. In the building process, there's times it's going to be hard, it's going to be tough, you're going to feel opposed, you're going to feel mocked, you're going to feel abandoned, you're going to feel rejected, you're going to feel discouraged. And it's in those times that when you take your things to prayer, the Lord will remind you of your why. So the second point is, they remembered their why. Why am I doing this? Why did I start this? Why am I in this in the first place? It's important that as we battle and as we build and as we pray and as we carry on that we remember our why. Why are we serving God? Why are we praying for them? Why are we trusting him? Why am I trying to get my life back together? Because I want my kids back. I want my health back. I want my mind back. I want my destiny back. It's in the battle and the torment and the mocking. You have to remember your why. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 6. Follow me. Verse 6. It says, 
So after the taunting and after the mocking, it says this at last. Somebody say at last. The wall was completed to half its height, which would have been just under 20 feet. For the people had worked with enthusiasm. Or in our translation, you can give verse, it says this. The people had a mind to work. You see, at this point, after the first bit of mocking and the first point of, 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 of all these accusations, Nehemiah took it to the Lord in prayer. He took it to God in prayer. And it was in that time in prayer when he said, Lord, I'm building something for you. Deal with them, Lord, while I continue on in my business. I want to say this to you this morning. It wasn't in my notes, but I felt the Lord drop it in my spirit as I was driving this morning. But some of us, right, online, if you're watching online, this is including you too, some of us, we don't come to church when we're going through stuff. Wow. Oh, oh. I'm not coming to church today. I'm, 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 I'm going through things. What you see through the example of Nehemiah was they were going through things. They were getting battle. They were getting through. They were doing all these things. But what you see was that every time they took it to prayer, the Lord gave them a second wind oh, and a third wind. And you see through the whole chapter 4, not once did they stop the building work. The worst thing you can do when you're going through a bad season is not to come to church. The worst thing you could do is to stay away from the Lord. But yet we still do it. I'm struggling, man. I'm just going to stay in my bed. What's that going to do? I'm struggling today. I'm just going to I'll have a lick of the pipe and I'm just going to go for a hit of the gear. What's that going to do? I'm struggling today, so I'm just going to sit in my bed, wallow in my pity, and eat loads of fruit from the fridge. What's that going to do? It's at times when you're struggling and in the battle. And in that time, it's times like that that you take it to prayer. Then you get your second wind. Then you get back up again and you get back in the battle. At this stage, the wall was complete to half its height. It says, for the people had worked with enthusiasm, which meant that in that place of prayer, the Lord had given them a second wind. They had got their sails back up. They were encouraged. They worked with enthusiasm. They got had given them a mind to work. They managed to build the wall to half its height. At halfway stage, the wall would have stood just under 20 feet. So at this stage in the building process, they were literally in above their heads. And they had become tired. At the halfway stage. And you know what? We're just after the halfway stage in the year. We're just coming into the, the month of July, which is kind of halfway through the year. And, and maybe you started off this year with a clear vision and a clear plan of how you wanted your life to look. Maybe you started off this year, you knew where you wanted to go, you knew what you were building, you knew what you desired. But maybe you find yourself at a halfway point, just like the children of Israel today, and say, you know what? I'm tired. I've been building all year, but all I see is rubble around me. I've been digging and I've been battling and I've been building and I've been praying. But, but everywhere I look, I still see work to get done. <laughs> Maybe you feel like they did in verse 10. Follow with me, verse 10. Then the people of Judah began to complain. No, I know there's no complainers in here. I know that's the church around the corner. <laughs> But the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired. There's so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by themselves. Watch this. Before they knew it, they were beginning to echo the words of the enemy. Remember in verse 2, the enemy said, what do they think they're going to do with all that rubble? They'll never build anything for their lives. They're halfway, through the, they're halfway through the building project. They're tired. They're weary. Now they start to believe what the enemy was saying. Before they knew it, they were echoing the words of the enemy. In their tiredness and weakness, they started to believe what the enemy was whispering. It's too much hard work, man. Ah, you're never going to make it. See, told you. You see, at this stage of the building process, 
The company you keep is crucial to your next move. I'm going to say that again. At this point in your building process, when you're weak and you're tired and beginning to believe the lies of the enemy, it is crucial. The company you surround yourself with. Watch this, Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 12, follow with me. The Jews who lived near the enemy, mm, my God. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again. They will come from all directions and attack us. The Jews who lived near the enemy, watch this, represents the Christians that live so close to the world. That they come with their worldly view and their worldly talk. When you're going through your situation and your trial and your struggle, you don't need to surround yourself with worldly Christians who live near the enemy. You need to surround yourself with Holy Ghost filled, godly people who have been through some bowels. You don't need to separate yourself from church. You need to get yourself to church. Online family. <laughs> but it's at this halfway point in the building process that you don't need to be surrounding yourself with Jews, with Christians who live so close to the world that they resemble them, that they talk like them, that their view is like them, their mindset is of them. I don't worry about it. Don't go to church. Just stay back and get gassed with me. Just stay back. Let's go to the park. Let's go get a sunbed. Let's go do something that will tickle our emotions. Mm. You see, you have to be careful who you accept advice from. When you're tired and weary, we need to place ourselves around godly spiritual people that will point us to the Lord and point us to the prayer closet. I'm a marathon runner. So far, I've run three marathons. I'm training for my fourth marathon right now. I'm running the Loch Ness Marathon on the 3rd of October. Five weeks into my marathon training and it's going all right. But I've run three marathons before. And every point of the marathon, just, just after the halfway stage, you start to question yourself. Man, why did I start this? Man, this is like, man, you know what? I've run 13 miles, man. I can't just call it a day. I've run more than other people have. Hmm. I've done more than they have back at home on their couch. <laughs> I can just call it a day and still be blessed and still be happy. But you see, the thing is, I never started just to quit halfway through. I started to finish the race. And I come to tell you, there will be moments in your walk with God where you will get tired and you will get weary and you will start to question yourself, why did I even start? But it's at that moment that you place yourself and surround yourself with people who's finished the marathon, not with people who's always quit and broke out. Listen, you don't take advice of an alcoholic about getting clean of alcohol. You don't take advice from someone that's bankrupt about a mortgage. When you're weak and weary and tired, it's important that you surround yourself with people that are going to point you to the end. That are going to pick you up if need be. That are going to encourage you if need be. That are going to remind you of your why if need be. In the marathon, it's important, especially as you go along, that you attend the fueling station. One mistake a lot of marathon, a lot of new marathon runners is, one mistake they make is they think, you know what, I can do this without stopping. I can do this without refueling. I can do this on my own strength. Yeesh. But the filling stations are so necessary along the journey. The filling station represents the church, represents prayer. It's where you take on some fluids. It's where you get energized and equipped again. It's where you take on fluids and you're ready to go again the next lap. Today I want to encourage you and let you know today that you're in the fueling station right now. This is your place to get refueled. 
This is your place to get refreshed. This is your place to go again. The third thing is, Nehemiah said in verse number 14, we're coming to an end. The third point says this, the third thing Nehemiah said to him was this, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. If you're taking notes, you'll see that I've first, you're probably not, but anyway. <laughs> the three points begin with an R. Hmm. No real reason, just thought it was smart. <laughs> <laughs> always looks better on your notes if you do that. Always looks better if I post something on social media later. You know, three hours, makes me look clever. <laughs> I'm not really. The third thing Nehemiah did was he said to the people, remember the Lord. Nehemiah 4 verse 14 says this, Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. One thing I love about Nehemiah is this, is that he wasn't afraid to tweak the strategy. He wasn't afraid to assess a situation honestly. He wasn't afraid to change the plan if it wasn't working. He wasn't afraid to tweak the strategy, change the plan, assess the situation, and go again. I want to encourage you and speak to you this morning. If your prayer life is failing, change the plan. If you're falling into temptation on a regular basis, switch it up and change the plan. Or whatever you're doing is not working. He assessed, he tweaked, and they continued to build until completion. And so Nehemiah was someone, when you look through the life of Nehemiah, he was someone, if you remember, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, the Bible says that he went to Jerusalem at night time. What did he do? Inspect the situation. At the halfway point here, when the, when the enemy was mocking him, when the enemy was attacking him, when the enemy was coming, what did he do again? He inspected the work again. He inspected the strategy and inspected the plan. And what he began to see was, he began to see, hey, you know what, I need to tweak the strategy because the enemy is kind of coming through me. And so I need to change my life and tweak my life and change my strategy and I need to fill in the gaps of my wall so that the enemy can stop coming through. Here's what Nehemiah could have done. He could have done nothing. And just hope for the best. Or he could have panicked and downed the tools. I said, ah, you know what, jog on, I'm finished. But what he does is he inspects the situation, he inspects the building, he inspects the process, he inspects it to see how can I tweak this, how can I change this. I sense that the enemy's coming through somewhere, the enemy's winning, the enemy, he's tempting, he's, he's tweaking, he, he's a opposition, he, he's, 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 he's mocking, a, a sense that I'm getting tired and I'm struggling and I've been building for the last six months and all I see is rubble all around me. I see that the people are getting tired, I see actually the people are getting ready to quit. So Nehemiah, as a prayerful man, comes before the people and says, hey, it's time that we tweak the plan. And so what he did was he says this, first thing he says to them when he tweaks the plan, he says, remember who the Lord is. And it's important that we never forget that the enemy is not as powerful as God. I know the enemy, he likes to lie to us. And he, lies, he tries to lie that he's all powerful, he's all known, listen, he's not. He's a created being that was cast out of heaven. He is not all powerful. He, he is not all powerful. He does not have the same power as God. He is not everywhere. He's not. All, he's not. And so what Nehemiah was saying, I know it's a journey. I know you're building. I know it can be struggle. I know it can be tiresome at times. I know you feel like quitting at times, but remember the Lord. Remember the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Remember the Lord that delivered you from addiction. Remember the Lord that set you free from prison. Remember the Lord that took you out of that madness. Remember the Lord who done all these things for you. If he got you through that, if he got you through this, if he got you through that, he'll get you through this. Remember the Lord. Somebody say, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious. Listen, we have to remember who is fighting for us. 
God is fighting for me. Pushing back the darkness. Well, I felt a little bit comfy when I was doing that. <laughs> <laughs> die flesh, die. <laughs> but we have to remember who's fighting for us. Because we remember him, because the next instruction was this. He says, Remember the Lord. But the next instruction was fight for. And so listen, he what he was saying was the first thing we do before we fight for, we need to know who's fighting for us. You see, because when we know who's fighting for us, then we're able to fight for. From a place of victory, not a place of defeat. And so when we remember who's fighting for us, we're able to fight for. Our sons, our daughters, our homes, our children, our grandchildren, our calling. We need to understand in the midst of the battle and halfway through when we're tired and weary, we need to remember who God is. Who he brought, where he brought us from, what he's able to do, that he's fighting for us. Then the next thing is, fight for. My God, we can't give in. We can't give up. we got to fight. It's the fight of our lives. Because it was the fight for their future. It was the fight for their children's inheritance. It was the fight for their children's life. It was the fight for their potential future. We have to learn to fight. How do we fight? By remembering who God is, by being people of prayer and remembering why we started in the first place. Mm-hmm. If we want a lace to count, we got to fight. If we want to see our family saved, Amen. we've got to fight. Amen. If we want to beat this addiction, we've got to fight. Amen. If we want our kids not to go through the same things we went through, we got to fight. Amen. Somebody say we got to fight. Got to fight. Let's stand to our feet this afternoon. Amen. Stephen, come forward. Let's stand to our feet this afternoon. Praise God. Billy Graham, the great evangelist who's now went to be with the Lord, he opened up the World Congress on Evangelism in Berlin in 1966. I don't know what else happened in 1966. I don't know. (laughs) Washed from my memory by the blood of Christ. He opened up this World Congress on Evangelism in Berlin in 1966 by stating the responsibility and opportunity given to each generation. He says these words, Every generation is crucial. Every generation is strategic. But we are not responsible for the past generation. And we cannot bear full responsibility for the next one. However, somebody say however. However, However, we do have a responsibility for our generation. This is what he's saying. God will hold us responsible at the judgment seat of Christ. For how well we fulfilled our responsibility and took advantage of our opportunities. I want to say that one more time. God will hold us responsible at the judgment seat of Christ for how well we fulfilled our responsibilities and took advantage of our opportunities. You know what? I know it gets tired sometimes, man. Nehemiah understood it was just tired. The building, day after day, brick after brick. Sometimes it seems like, man, I don't, I'm not getting anywhere. Sometimes I can't see no progress. Sometimes all I see is rubble all around me. But Nehemiah committed everything to the Lord in prayer. And the Lord gave him another wind and instruction and strategy on how to keep on building. Somebody say we've got to fight we got to fight for our generation. Fathers, you've got to fight for your children. Even if you don't see them, you got to fight for them. you got to call their names out to heaven. I feel broken right now, man. I feel the presence of the Lord here. Amen. 
Mothers, you've got to fight for your sons that are lost in the streets. Yes, for sure. <laughs> we have to fight for them. Yes, we got to fight for those prostitutes on the corner. We got to fight for them addicts that are broken. We got to fight, church. I can't tell you today, man, don't give up the fight. Don't give up the fight, man of God. Don't give up the fight for your calling, woman of God. Don't give up the fight for your unsaved husband, woman. Don't give up the fight for your unsaved wife. Don't give up the fight for your marriage. Fight for that thing. Don't give up the fight. Remember the Lord. Remember how great and glorious he is. Lift our hands a minute. The presence of the Lord is here. The Bible says in verse 15, when the enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to the work on the wall. You see, even though they were struggling and battling and building, they never stopped building. They never stopped coming to church. They never stopped praying. Yes, they were struggling. And yes, they were battling. And yes, they were being mocked. But they turned to God at every opportunity and said, God, you fight for me. Yes. I'm fighting God. I'm struggling. I'm weary. I'm broken and I'm empty. But God, I'm not giving in the fight. The Bible says this. But from then on, somebody say from then on. The strategy shifted. The laborers carried on their work with one hand on their load and another hand on their weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. In verse number 23, the last verse, section B at the end, we carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. They never stopped building. They kept fighting. They kept believing. They remembered their why. They remember why they did it in the first place. They remember why the enemy was attacking them. They remember why they were being mocked and they felt they'd given up. But they turned to God and they said, you know what, God, I remember you, Lord. Verse 14 again said this Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and victory at Woods Glasgow. Online church. Fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives and fight for your homes. Don't 
throw in the towel. Healing is here. Come on, just, just lift up your hands to the Lord right now. Healing is here. Oh, Jesus. Healing is here. And I receive it. Oh, don't give up the faith. Lift up your hands. Healing is here. And I receive it. And I receive it. I reach my hands to the heavens. I lift my eyes where my hell comes from. I look to you, my rock, my healer. I trust in you. Lord, I trust in you. Freedom is here. Come on, speak to him. Say, Lord, I've given up. I've, 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 freedom is here. Lord, maybe I stop believing for my children. Maybe I stop believing for my son. Maybe I stop believing for my wife. I stop believing for my children. I receive. But Lord, today I declare on this day of declaration. Freedom is here. That I will not give up the fight. That I will not give in to the enemy. That I will not give in to mockery or taunting or accusations. But I will stand and I will fight and I will pray and I will believe and I will lift up my eyes to heaven and I will lift up my voice to the Lord. We remember your mercy. We remember your 